All right. Good afternoon and good morning or good evening to wherever you are in the world. Uh, and welcome to the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. I'm Desmond Patton. I'm the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the DSI and the faculty member in the School of Social Work and Department of Sociology. I'm so very excited to welcome Deborah Raji to the Race and Data Science Lecture Series. Deborah is a new PhD student at the University of California, um, Berkeley, and a Mozilla Fellow interested in algorithmic auditing. She also works closely with the Algorithmic Justice League Initiative to highlight bias in deployed AI products. She has also worked with Google's ethical AI team and been a research fellow at the Partnership on AI and AI Now Institute at NYU, working on various projects to operationalize ethical considerations in machine learning engineering practice. Recently, she was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 and MIT Tech Review 35 Under 35 Innovators. We're so very excited to have you. Thank you. I appreciate um, uh, participating in this series. Um, I've been watching the past talks and learned a lot from um, the past talks in the series. So I'm super honored uh, and super grateful to actually be participating as well. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, a topic that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, and this is sort of a, der a derivative uh, talk from one I'd given earlier on um, audits and accountability and sort of the challenges of doing that work. Uh, but I want to tie it more closely to the reality of the harms that we see with AI systems and the urgent need for accountability, kind of highlighting the importance of doing this work. I'm not going to be focusing on solutions as much as I typically would, um, but I'm going to mention at the end sort of some strategies that we've used to address these issues, but that's not going to be the focus of this particular talk. Oops, how do I, let me see if I can. So um, I want to first introduce you to a couple of people. So this is Josea Elston Burrell. Um, he was a 12-year student um, in the UK and was hoping to be able to enter university in the fall. Um, this was actually his second attempt at uh, getting admissions into university. He was going to be the first in his family. Unfortunately, his uh, during his senior year, uh, due to COVID, he wasn't able to sit for his final A-level exam. As a result of that, um, the there had been an algorithm deployed in order to automatically adjust the grades given to him by his teachers to accommodate the fact that he had not been able to be physically there for the exam. Uh, these algorithms were black box, nobody understood how they worked, and in his particular case, it changed several of his grades below the threshold of what he needed to be able to confirm acceptance into university. Um, there's a great article in the, Gu the Guardian that goes over his personal Sega of losing that admission spot and fighting to get it back through any means possible. Um, fortunately, at the end, he did get a spot, but it was after a lot of turmoil and anxiety. Uh, next, I want to introduce you to Tammy Dobes. Um, she has been suffering for most of her life with cerebral palsy and has been dependent on um, state issued health care in order to be able to get the accommodations that she needs to address her disability. Um, unfortunately, in her state, there was an algorithm used to reassign the number of hours, caretaker hours, she was entitled to under uh, the state licensed health care regime. Uh, again, we have a situation where the algorithm made a very serious mistake and uh, she was um, given sort of the option of paying money she did not have to receive the healthcare that she needed um, or finding an alternative source for uh, insurance. So again, a situation where an algorithm um, made a mistake and uh, it jeopardized in this case, the health of, of, of Tammy. And the final person I wanna introduce you to is Robert Williams. Um, you know, literally uh, uh, close to his birthday, he was falsely arrested in his front lawn um, for a crime he did not commit. Once he arrived at the police station, confused, uh, he found out that uh, he had been falsely identified. He had been falsely uh, identified as a suspect um, through a false facial recognition match. And uh, the whole situation was traumatic. His kids saw him getting arrested. Um, he was emotional. Um, and later on would go on to sue that police department, but after a lot of turmoil and again, a lot of life disruption. So these are the people kind of hidden in a lot of the headlines we see today around algorithmic bias and specifically algorithmic bias cases where the algorithm fails on a particular subset of the population. 
Um, so another example is, you know, when you read something about an algorithm used to automate, let's say, fraud detection, uh, as in the case of the Michigan government's use of the Midas algorithm to detect cases of fraud and unemployment filings, uh, you have these mistakes. In this case, 20,000 cases, <clears throat> 20,000 cases were fraud uh, were were sort of wrongfully accused of uh, fraudulently seeking unemployment payments, and that seems, uh, you know, like a lot of cases, and and that's sort of really what a lot of articles get at, but then you don't understand that what that actually means is that, you know, Brian Russell, who was one of the cases, um, uh, had the situation uh, escalate his own uh, desperateness to provide for his kids after losing his job, and then actually led to personal bankruptcy filing. And we also don't see the fact that, you know, after the false accusation, the state cleared him of these charges two years later, you know, after he has been struggling uh, to provide for his family and also clear, uh, you know, clear his name through legal processes for two years. So we can see that the, the lived experience of those going through algorithmic harm um, is so much more dire and tragic than some of these headlines would suggest. Another situation is that of tenant screening. Um, algorithms are used in an estimated uh, it, for an estimated nine out of uh, 10 landlords, by an estimated nine out of 10 landlords across the country. Um, it's cheap and it's fast and it can help you sort of take a bunch of applications and process them to find information about potential tenants. Um, and uh, it's notoriously inaccurate. Uh, often uh, names will be confused. So individuals will be confused with those with a similar sounding name um, or um, with a similar last name that are not actually related. Um, and as a result, a lot of people get unfairly denied an opportunity to stay in a particular apartment or house um, uh, because of these tenant screening tools. So one example, like I mentioned, sort of the individualized version of this issue is Devon Jackson, who's denied low-income housing in Tennessee. And as a result, him and his nine-year-old daughter are forced to live in a small motel room for nearly a year. So the consequences of these failures and these errors is incredibly uh, real and severe. Oh, sorry. Um, another example is that of, you know, uh, close to home in modern eras is the vaccine allocation algorithm. Um, in this case, that deployed by uh, Stanford Medicine, um, where the vaccine allocation algorithm only uh, provided or only prioritized to give about seven doses to over five of the 5,000 available doses to frontline house staff. And this is because um, the, those on the ground in the hospital were junior um, and lightly younger. And the algorithm didn't account for the fact that they were uh, dealing with patients in person and were in thus greater need of these vaccines. And um, uh, the sort of individualized harm that came out of this, uh, this failure of this algorithm uh, is that of Nuriel, who was a neurology resident at Stanford, um, and he had to go to another hospital um, in a neighboring county in order to get vaccinated to protect himself and his family and his patients. Um, and he talked about how he had vulnerable um, uh, re relatives that were sort of vulnerable to, to dire consequences of not being of him not being vaccinated and working in a hospital dealing with patients regularly. So the fear associated with losing access to that resource and that opportunity to be vaccinated was a serious drawback on his ability to even do his job. So again, we can see these very severe, serious, dire individual harms arising as a result of these systematic algorithmic failures. So, you know, when we see uh, headlines like this, um, uh, and there's so many headlines that I could have added here, these, this, these are actually, if anything, uh, quite outdated. Uh, when we see headlines like this of algorithms sort of disproportionately functioning for one group over another group, um, what we are actually really seeing are thousands and thousands and thousands of individual cases of real people being harmed in serious ways. So the fact of the matter is that when AI fails, people get hurt. And the word fails here is doing a lot of labor. It doesn't necessarily only mean accuracy or performance. There's so many ways in which AI fails to deliver on its promises for sure, but there's also other ways and other dimensions through which it fails those that it's supposed to serve. And as a result of that, real people, genuinely you know, uh, real members of our society are, are getting regularly um, affected negatively and dealing with very serious consequences. 
And you know, uh, you might have already noticed of the examples I provided, there's a pattern in terms of who gets hurt. Um, it's usually women, young people, the elderly, those with disabilities, people of color, low income individuals. Um, it's those that are least informed or least involved in AI development. Uh, so most removed from the actual system itself. And it's those with the least access to recourse. You can see in some of the examples, it took a year, maybe two years for someone to be able to clear their name of a false accusation or for them to be able to recover from the consequence that arose as a result of the faulty algorithm. So um, these are probably the most vulnerable populations in society being disproportionately impacted by these systems. And um, an analogy I like to give is that of a car crash. If you think of, um, you know, someone building a car uh, and, uh, you know, having uh, someone getting into a car and having that car crash, uh, there's a lot to think about in terms of who's accountable. If it's the, the person that created the car, the driver itself, the roads, uh, there's a lot to think about in terms of how we distribute blame when something goes wrong. And especially when something goes wrong in a way that hurts another person. Uh, if you crash into a pedestrian, who is actually going to be able to pay for that or compensate for that pedestrian's harm? Um, so this is the kind of question that we need to start asking about AI products. If the car crashes, why is it that we're regularly seeing crashes, but no one's being held accountable. Uh, the manufacturer is not being questioned. The, the, those driving the car is not being questioned. The, those building the roads aren't being questioned. And as a result, we just see more and more car crashes without any level of accountability. So there's urgency to this work uh, because there are real people being affected. None of this is uh, you know, theoretical or speculative. I know that sometimes when people like to talk about AI ethics, they'll bring in philosophy and they'll like to speak at a very high level about the issue. Um, there is definitely space for that, but there's also this other layer of things happening where um, we are regularly seeing sort of premature algorithmic deployments, often being branded as AI tools, um, but hurting very real people in a way that requires an urgent attention towards accountability and understanding who we actually need to um, confront in order for people to be protected and to be able to um, proceed with their everyday lives without this fear of being uh, of facing very serious consequences because of a faulty algorithm. So um, today, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, how we can get to a point of accountability with these systems. I'm going to start with some reminders because there's a lot of things that I learned doing this work um, that I think uh, I should also remind this crowd about how these algorithms actually work in the real world as deployments and how that affects real people. Um, then I'm going to go into what I mean by alg algorithmic accountability. And then we're going to talk about sort of this challenge, a specific type of accountability a challenge on responsibility, some interventions that have been tried out, and then other challenges that we're still thinking about and working through. So, you know, first, uh, some important reminders. So, you know, for one, uh, I don't know if anyone here has seen The Social Dilemma. It's a very popular uh, documentary. It's talking about social media addiction and disinformation, and uh, the kind of moral of the story for that movie was, you know, turn off your phone, just turn it off. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the real world, a lot of the algorithms affecting people are not things that you can turn off uh, easily at all or at all. Um, they're, they're usually algorithms that are uh, imposed on a population outside of their control. Um, and completely uh, often without their knowledge. So if you think about some of the examples I gave of you know, facial recognition being used by the police or um, healthcare systems using algorithms to make operational decisions, these are not things that anyone uh, impacted by the situation is gonna be in a position to be able to push back against or even know about um, in their everyday lives. So there's a lot of algorithms that are directly tied to consumer technologies where the user and the affected population is one in the same, uh, such as you know the the social media algorithms discussed in the social dilemma, where you know I can turn off my phone and I don't have to deal with that. Um, however, a lot of cases um, that uh, we're looking at and we analyze involve algorithms where the user is not the same as the affected population, those that are impacted by the algorithm, and those that are 
making use of the algorithm and their decision making are different populations, different people, a teacher making use of an algorithm on a student, a doctor making use of an algorithm on a patient, uh, police making use of an algorithm on a community. And as a result of that discrepancy, uh, you know, the community, the patient and the student are not in a position to turn off the algorithm unless they advocate actively for themselves. So um, the social dilemma type scenario is not actually the one I'm going to be talking about. Um, and it's not the, the kind of situations that I deal with in my work. The sort of second uh, image here is that of a Roomba. Um, I don't know if people still use Roombas. That, they're very nice. They're kind of these robot vacuums. Um, they're also the most widely deployed robots in the country. So there's about, well, there's over 1 million, I think 1.6 million Roombas distributed throughout the United States, which is remarkable. Um, and, uh, you know, they're everywhere. They're in a lot of different homes. And what they do is they just vacuum and they're, they're impactful because they affect the lives in small ways of a lot of different people. And I think sometimes when people think about what a robot means, uh, they think of something like Sophia the robot, uh, the Saudi, Saudi Arabia sort of, uh, Saudi Arabian, uh, like very humanoid robot. You know, it has a smile, it has a face. Uh, it's very humanistic. Um, unfortunately, there's only maybe one or two of those kind of robots, those very humanoid robots, but there's, like I mentioned, over a million Roombas. The world is full of Roombas uh, and only has maybe one or two Sophias, even though that's the image of what we think, uh, you know, robotics looks like. It's the exact same thing in AI. I think a lot of people have perceptions of what they think AI is. There's a lot of sci-fi movies glamorizing these sort of hyper-intelligent, you know, singularity-driven um, uh, you know, hyper intelligent, uh, you know, hyper intelligent type models. Um, you know, we see Watson and we see all these kind of cool demos of AI tools, AlphaGo and things like that. When in reality, the world is actually full of a lot of Roombas. A lot of these systems are quite simple, but they affect the lives of a lot of people in very small, remarkable ways. Um, and, and that's really the type of algorithm that we're going to be, in, that we're going to be encountering. And that's exactly what we sort of see in the real world. And then the final image here, um, you might recognize him. That's Robert Williams. I introduced you guys to him earlier. Um, and he's just a reminder of the fact that uh, we're talking about real people. We're talking about real scenarios. Um, the systems I'm going to discuss today are uh, non-hypothetical and non-speculative. They're real. <laughs> um, so uh, just a reminder that you know none of there's a version of this conversation that could be very speculative and very high level. And I think that there's, uh, there might be value in that, but I'm very focused on um, situations involving real people. So to sort of give more concrete examples of what I was speaking earlier, you know, here is uh, the Stanford algorithm that made the decision around vaccine allocation. As you can see, it's very simple. It's a rule-based algorithm, um, but it ended up affecting uh, the lives of thousands of residents uh, at, the, at the hospital. So um, again, a reminder that you know, these are Roombas. They're very simple algorithms, but they're very consequential. Another example, again, is that, you know, sometimes when people like to talk about AI ethics, they evoke the moral machine and they'll talk about self-driving cars and how, you know, should the self-driving car hit the baby or the grandma? Um, and I'm here to say, you know, well, there's maybe like 1400 self-driving cars and they're all in test mode and regulated to various degrees in terms of where they can go. Not to say that that's not consequential. I'll speak later to the fact that it is um, and that, uh, you know, this industry does need to think about safety very seriously. But these moral machine scenarios are not something that we're necessarily facing as a issue today. Um, however, you know, there was this great audit of an algorithm used uh, for over a hundred million people um, uh, to make decisions about who gets a bed in a hospital and who gets to get access to urgent care based off of uh, a variety of incoming attributes. And that algorithm uh, is much simpler than a self-driving car, um, but incredibly consequential and affecting literally hundreds of millions of people. In this case, the algorithm was found to be uh, disproportionately biased against black patients um, and uh, favoring white patients due to the type of data that was used to input into the algorithm. But as you can see here, like this is a situation of something that's already deployed in the world, affecting hundreds of millions of people already, um, and thus making an intervention on this kind of algorithm is incredibly consequential and immediately consequential. So this is the kind of um, these are the kind of algorithms or AI systems that uh, we tend to focus on. Oh. 
So the second question or the second point here to make is, well, uh, you know, we now understand to some degree how these algorithms show up in the real world and how that differs from, uh, you know, maybe how we might imagine AI to be theoretically. Um, so what is algorithmic accountability? What does it actually mean uh, to take these algorithms in the real world and hold different stakeholders accountable for their part to play in determining the outcome of the algorithm and thus the consequence for this affected population? So uh, this is like a little bit of a more technical definition, but algorithmic accountability is really a version of accountability, of, of mainstream accountability, where we say, you know, we have certain actors or certain individuals that have agency within a system to make certain decisions about what the algorithm does and how the algorithm's outcomes are going to be affecting a population. And the forum is really that affected population. And the dynamic in an accountable system is one where those making decisions about uh, those making decisions that affect algorithmic outcomes um, are accountable to those being affected by these algorithmic outcomes. And what accountability means is that those that are affected are able to demand the information that they need from the decision makers in order to make a judgment about how well those decision makers are making their decisions. And ideally, their judgment of how well these decision makers are operating um, should lead to consequences. It should be a situation where if they don't think actors are doing a good job, they would be able to remove the algorithm from their situ from their context, or they would be able to um, you know, fire the actors and institute in, in, um, uh, establish new actors um, or, uh, or modify certain decisions made by those actors. So this interplay between being able to demand information that you need to make a really good judgment as to how well the decisions are being made about you are being made, and then having that judgment be consequential is this dynamic of accountability. So in, in the context of AI or with algorithms, it gets a little bit tricky. You know, uh, there's so many different actors. There's so many different people that have influence on the outcome of the algorithm. And there's so many stakeholders that determine a model's capacity to do harm as a result. So if we want different outcomes from the algorithm, you know, who actually needs to take action and who actually needs to face consequences? So uh, an analogy I like to give is, again, going back to that car crash analogy, where if a car crashes, who's actually responsible and what are sort of the categories of stakeholders that are responsible? So, um, you know, on one level, oh, oh, sorry. So, um, you know, we, we sort of have these three major areas of accountability, broadly speaking, and it also applies to algorithmic development as well. So on one level, you know, you have this challenge of engineering responsibility or those that built the algorithm. In the context of the car crash, what this means is those that built the car, the car manufactured, like, did they include brakes? Is it possible, you know, do they have a proper steering mechanism? Did they, did they build in safety mechanisms? That conversation is a conversation of engineer responsibility. Those that built the system, in this case, the algorithm, you know, how can we hold them accountable for the decisions that they made as they built this system? The sort of second challenge is that of operator accountability. Uh, if you want to think about it as the driver, the person controlling the algorithm or making use of the algorithm in, in this case. Um, so if you have a drunk driver of a car that crashes into a pedestrian, that, that drunk driver, that reckless driver is the one that's going to be held accountable. So the operator accountability question also applies to algorithms. There's um, you know, a recent case of shot spotter where uh, you had a police department take an algorithm and modify the results of that algorithm's outcome. Um, and that's them operating independent of the algorithm's function and the way the algorithm is being built in order to um, you know, lead to, to negative uh, consequences for the affected population. So sometimes you have the driver that makes the mistake and that's kind of under this realm of operator accountability. And then the sort of third major challenge is that of structural harms. So you know, uh, in the context of the, the car analogy, it's sort of the roads, the quality of the roads. Are there potholes? Um, you know, was there um, a too narrow road or too wide a road, and that caused the car to lose control in whatever way? Uh, maybe the lights by the road were not lit, so the the driver couldn't really see very well. Uh, in this case, you know, the the blame is to is to be is is very infrastructural, and we also have that with algorithms as well. There's sort of historical legacies and norms of society at large that leads us to have certain default data sets. Um, that make it very difficult to build a good, a good data set or make it very difficult to deploy it in a way that is effective. Um, and, and those structural harms can also be to blame for some of these uh, failures and these, uh, these issues. Um, and that's also like another major challenge of accountability. Who do you blame or how do you um, hold someone to account for these structural harms? So, uh, you know, today, oh, 
sorry. Uh, today, we're going to focus on just engineering responsibility. Um, pretty much just looking at this question of uh, those that build these tools, you know, how do we get them to build these tools in a way that's accountable? Um, there's a couple of reasons for why to start here. I think one is that, you know, it's very easy to identify who builds these tools and thus this conversation of accountability becomes a lot more straightforward. Um, I think another thing as well is that uh, we don't actually do a really good job building these tools. The AI industry is full of a lot of uh, snake oil, a lot of products that make false promises. So there's actually a lot of work to do in, make, in making sure that those that build these tools uh, do so in a way that they're that is responsible. Uh, you know, the concept of engineering responsibility is one that's existed for a very long time. Um, Unsafe at Any Speed is a very popular book from, by Ralph Nader, talking about the quality of building cars that have proper steering systems and proper brakes to protect those that are driving and those that are on the street. Um, there's also the very infamous case of the Quebec Bridge, um, where Theodore Cooper, uh, the lead engineer for that uh, for that project, was named as the leading cause for the bridge's collapse in 1904. Um, and the early in the early uh, 20th century, and you know that case is really this landmark demonstration of the fact that as the person constructing the tool, you have certain responsibilities to make sure that it's a well constructed bridge, it's a well constructed car that's not hurting people. You need to make decisions, and you have sort of a due diligence to think about safety as you build these things, so they don't collapse and hurt people. <laughs> um, so, what does that look like in AI in the context of AI? So, one example is one that I mentioned earlier, which was Michigan's unemployment fraud detection system. Um, an internal review found that you know there were multiple cases adjudicated by the algorithm that were incorrect, and it was up to eighty-five percent incorrect fraud determinations. Later on, they would find that they uh, you know, the, the, the team that had built this algorithm uh, migrated their data from a legacy system without properly inspecting that data, um, you know, did not properly test the system before deploying it on real people. Uh, there's just so many mistakes that were made as part of the engineering process of building this algorithm. The algorithm has, you know, is correct, you know, less than 30% of the time, uh, you know, there's actual danger just involved in having this really faulty, shabbily built system out there in the world making a very important decision about, um, you know, accusing someone of fraud. Uh, the other, uh, you know, example I use of like engineering responsibility considerations in uh, AI is um, the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, you know, when they looked at some of the early crashes for Uber and Tesla, um, uh, self-driving car systems, they actually named uh, a lack of engineering responsibility or engineering safety considerations as one of the causes for these crashes. So in the case of Uber, yes, you did have the test driver sort of not paying attention at the wheel, but there was uh, no design mechanisms to keep her attention. So there was nothing to keep her hands on the wheel. Um, and also the actual computer vision system uh, that they were testing uh, was not able to detect jaywalkers at all. So they hadn't tested for a lot of very common scenarios. And as a result, um, you know, they, they pretty much failed in their responsibility to do much more testing before putting these systems on the road. Um, so this is again, sort of another example of a very clear failure of engineering responsibility. And we see this a lot in healthcare as well. I can't really get into the details of these cases, um, but IBM Watson definitely try to deploy a lot of systems in the healthcare space without proper testing. And you know the poor construction of these systems led to a lot of um, false diagnoses and a lot of hospitals drop these systems as a result. Um, and then you know Rachel Thomas has a really great article on machine learning's use in medicine and how there's inherent limitations of how to leverage that data in that context. So you know given the fact that we have these systems that are shoddily built, and we know that those that are building these systems um, have some responsibility, you know, what can we actually do to hold them to account? So one thing we can do is we can audit these systems. So there's two main sort of categories of audits. One is this idea of an internal audit, and this is really conducted by anyone that has a contractual relationship with the audit target. 
Um, so this is, uh, you know, a first a first party audit. So thinking of, you know, IBM, Google, Microsoft's internal responsible innovation teams or AI ethics teams, um, but it could also be a second party audit. So think of uh, consultants, hired consultants like Accenture um, or Kathy O'Neill's Orca that are sort of paid by the company. They sign a contract and they come in to do the audit. And those internal auditors um, have direct access to the system. They can look at the system before deployment. Uh, they're pretty much employees, so it's kind of executed by these people that have a contractual relationship with the company, and they focus a lot on compliance and control. They just want to make sure that um, the company is not getting sued, <laughs> and as a result, they just um, want to make sure that the company passes a certain bar in terms of quality expectations. They might use like the company's AI principles as the expectations or regula regulatory environments as, as the bar. External auditors um, are, you know, regulators, journalists, um, Civil, civil society groups um, ad, and advocacy groups. Um, you know, so think of the markup, uh, ProPublica, the FDA, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, um, ACLU, uh, the Algorithmic Justice League where I work. Um, and, and external auditors really have no contractual relationship with the audit target. Uh, they're looking at things indirectly. So they usually have like a consumer level access to the system. They probably have as much access as any other affected population member. Um, maybe a little bit more, but they definitely don't write a contract with the company that they're auditing. And they're looking at things post-deployment. Uh, so often they are pulled in after the system's already out there in the world and they're analyzing the outcomes of that. Um, then, and these audits are executed completely independently. So um, again, no contractual relationship with those that they're auditing and they get to focus on the groups that they represent. So because they're coming in and they don't have any influence by the audit target, they can ask whatever questions are in the best uh, interest of those that they are sort of mandated to protect. Oops. So, oops. sorry, one second. Uh, so we'll start by talking about internal audits because this is sort of the legacy audit that everyone knows about. So internal audits are really this third line of defense for those that have any familiarity with auditing terminology, but they're this internally independent team. They're not necessarily part of um, you know, quality control or the engineering process directly itself, but they kind of operate across various teams within the institution to make sure that the, the company is acting in compliance to whatever external and internal expectations are, there are. And the main strategy for going about this um, in the AI context is through documentation. So we have like several proposals here um, of data documentation. There's also this idea of model cards, which is really this model documentation strategy where you write down the details of the model in order to be able to communicate about the model across various teams within an institution. And that's really the, in, the main internal audit strategy at this point is this idea of, well, let's like just collect information and articulate and communicate amongst ourselves what's happening with this model as a way to be internally accountable for the decisions being made about this model. Um, so Google was really the first to approach this model cards idea. And here's uh, their model card for uh, their prospective API product that was filtering out comments um, for you know, mainstream news outlets like the New York Times. Um, and uh, they also kind of developed a bunch of these toolkits to help people create model cards as quickly as possible. So you know, they had these initial sort of documentation proposals um, but we found that there were also a bunch of other document templates from other industries in finance and healthcare and aerospace where um, really the diversity of the ways in which you can create documentation and leverage documentation for internal accountability is really vast. So you can actually include and force those participating in these processes to reflect on what they're doing and write down the decisions that they're making at each step to hold them accountable at each step. Um, so an example of, you know, documents that we had brought in from other industries that try, that were sort of attempted um, at an institution like Google was that of the failure modes and effects analysis document. So this is a situation where they identified every feature. You think about how users interact with a particular feature and what the intended response is, what the potential failure modes could be, what the impact of that failure mode could be, and how severe it was um, in terms of the consequence, but also how detectable it was, how visible the problems were. Um, so this is again, an example of just how documentation is really the main strategy for internal accountability uh, in these AI companies. And uh, all of this is kind of discussed in this 
paper that I worked on called the Smactor Framework, where we talk about how uh, you know various documents can really support uh, internal accountability mechanisms. When you're inside a company and you have access to everything within the company, uh, it's you know very possible to record information that can lead to better accountability across the entire institution. Uh, there's also groups like the Partnership on AI that think about this systematically across various companies. Uh, their About a Mal project is really kind of the, the, the gathering ground for this. Um, however, sort of the downside of internal auditing is what happened to my friend Tim Nick Gerbru, where um, you're still an employee. So you're still contractually um, uh, you know, obligated to work on behalf of the company. So as a result, when you speak out, um, uh, the company can fire you if they don't like what you're saying or if what you're saying contradicts their profit motive. Um, and that's exactly what happened to Timnit when she identified issues with, uh, you know, their DNI strategy and uh, their their building of these large language models, which is a huge part of their future product roadmap. Um, uh, you know, uh, she was challenged within the company to the point of being pushed out. Um, so that's definitely the main downside of internal auditing as an accountability strategy. You're just going to face the wall of uh, having to, because of your contractual relationship with the company, of having to, um, uh, uh, I guess, be limited in what you can speak out against. Uh, the other fact is that you can't speak out as publicly because you're probably under NDA and such. So, you know, what else can we do if we can't internally audit? Um, you know, a lot of my work has been focused on auditing from the outside. So uh, as a third party auditor, you have an opportunity to really question these systems and hold them accountable. So we were not the first to do that. <laughs> there is a long history of, um, you know, academic work, work by different regulators, work by journalists um, in order to inspect these systems from the outside. Um, and, you know, uh, however, there were sort of issues in terms of uh, consistent issues that were being faced by those that were operating as third party auditors. So for one, the benchmarks that we were all using were quite biased. Uh, the evaluation test sets that we were using to sort of uh, uh, inspect whether or not these systems were operating well or not uh, were themselves biased. So we couldn't really get a good glimpse of how well these systems were working. Uh, the other issue is that it's really hard to access the target. Your third party, you don't have any information about what's going on on the inside. Um, so uh, directly targeting a particular model within a larger product is really difficult. Uh, the third thing is public pressure. So you know a lot of people would publish these audits and they would anonymize the, the companies or they would, um, they would only name a single company and the companies just would ignore it. it there would be no public attention and it, it would just kind of blow over. Um, so that was a huge concern in terms of external auditors, um, a, a, a huge concern for external auditors. Uh, and then the final thing is this issue of hostile corporate reactions. So uh, when you audit a company, especially if you have no sort of uh, contractual relationship with them, they get really mad, uh, they, they, they sue you, <laughs> um, they, they retaliate in very serious ways. Um, and that was something that we were scared of from the beginning. So a question that we came in with was this question of, well, how can algorithmic audits be designed to address these challenges and lead corporations to mitigate bias concerns? You know, how can we actually use audits as a way to get to accountability? So uh, we looked at anti-discrimination law to think about intersectionality and the design of our benchmark. Um, we looked at HCI community to think about audit design um, and specifically puppeting uh, users in order to be able to get access to these systems. Uh, we looked at financial audits to think about publicly naming multiple targets uh, to get some publicity and some public pressure. And then we looked at information security to think about how to communicate to both the companies about our results and the public in a way that was responsible and ethical. And uh, I can't get into too much of this today, but um, you know, here's a, sort of a quick overview of what that actually looked like or what, how that actually ended up working for this project I worked on. Uh, looking at the disparate performance of facial recognition systems, um, commercial facial recognition systems. So, you know, for one, we noticed that in the facial recognition field, uh, you know, the data sets that were being used to test these systems were disproportionately lighter and male. So we built this PPB benchmark that was much more balanced in terms of representation for male, female and darker, lighter. Um, and you can see here that once we built that benchmark and we evaluated the products of Microsoft, Face++, Plus Plus, and IBM on those benchmarks, um, uh, it became very clearly visible that the performance of these systems on the darker female subgroup was incredibly subpar. 
so after we had released those results, uh, the corporations were saying that they had made improvements over time and that they had been, been changes and that, uh, you know, actual accountability had resulted from our, our, our work. Um, so about a year later, we re-audited these systems and identified the fact that the initial audit was actually effective in terms of getting the companies to pay attention to uh, the, the failures of their system on a particular subgroup, and they were able to sort of adjust their systems, redeploy, within seven months, all of them redeployed new APIs, and were able to imp radically improve performance on this darker female subgroup. So here's the result for IBM, Face++, Microsoft. And what that did, what that audit did, the kind of purpose of that external audit was to ask a very specific question and challenge the functionality of that system in a particular way um, that could make it impossible to make this kind of claim. So uh, before our audit work kind of launched, uh, you know, we would see claims like this all the time where these systems were not working. You know, in the computer vision community for a long time, people saw facial recognition as a solved problem. And our audits really put that into question and especially made it impossible to sort of say this thing of, oh, it's harder to take a good picture of a person with dark skin than a person with white skin. So that's why our system doesn't work for this other group and is putting this other group at risk at a higher degree. Um, you know, now we understand that at least these three companies were able to make drastic improvements after just a year. Uh, there's no excuse as to why that system would not, would be deployed without being properly tested on its performance on these different subgroups. Um, and also something else that we discovered in this follow-up study was that, you know, you would have uh, certain companies that were not audited, uh, such as Amazon or Kairos, uh, that consistently uh, had these disparities between the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. And that revealed just sort of the narrow scope of an audit, um, uh, the narrow scope of an audit where um, uh, you could really, uh, you could really tell that, uh, you know, performance improvement due to being audited once uh, uh, was only really applicable to the target companies from the initial audit. So if they weren't audited or if they weren't called out explicitly, even if they were in the same industry selling the same product, these other companies hadn't made any improvements at all. Um, and you know, about a year later, after our follow-up audit, uh, NIST did a much more comprehensive a survey study of uh, facial recognition tools being used. And they looked at face verification and face identification in addition to facial analysis. And they found that Asian and African-American people were up to a hundred times more likely to be misidentified than white men by these tools, which was an incredible finding um, given the fact that so many people had thought facial recognition was the solved problem for so long. Also, you know, a lot of uh, pilot studies revealed that these technologies did not function very well once deployed in the real world. Uh, I'm gonna skim through so that we can finish on time. Um, uh, you know, but the challenge with uh, external audits is that you know once we audited these systems, uh, a paywall came up. Uh, so uh, in this case, we audited Kairos, and as a result, they put you know their lowest level of access at ninety nine dollars a month, and then they forced you to go through this terms of service agreement that made it impossible for you to audit the system. Uh, the other thing as well is that some of these companies didn't respond exactly as we liked them to. Um, here is IBM's response to our study where they thought, okay, well, you know, one way to improve the performance of these systems is to diversify the faces that we use to train these systems. Um, but they sourced their faces from, uh, you know, uh, Flickr images and as a result uh, violated the privacy of those Flickr users. Um, so that was not the response that we wanted to see. So when your audit is sort of focused on a particular uh, aspect of the system, then people just optimize for performance on that and they don't think more critically about um, how to address issues. So this issue of exploitation and consent and privacy came up when people were trying to diversify data. Uh, the other issue is that, like I mentioned, uh, scope of impact was very narrow. So you only really target a specific demographic, a specific prediction task and company. So here we show that, you know, the audited companies would improve on gender classification, but the disparities would persist in something like age classification. And even our benchmark, you know, was biased in terms of age distribution. So our benchmark wasn't perfect in terms of representing every demographic failure that could happen. And then the sort of final issue with uh, external audits is that it doesn't address this issue of, you know, discredited pseudoscience and facial recognition. A lot of people use facial recognition to try to make claims of performance and hireability or criminality or affect or character or sexuality. Those are things that you can't predict from a face. 
and um, doing an external audit isn't going to hold someone accountable for this pseudoscience. So, you know, what else can we do in terms of accountability? And I see my time is short, so I'm going to um, breeze past this. But, you know, another thing we can do is that we can regulate. So, uh, you know, if if an audit is not necessarily drawing the attention of the company to the point where they feel that they have to make an intervention of as to how they build these technologies and deploy these technologies, then another way to hold those engineering the system to account is to regulate that system. And that happened with facial recognition. There was a sweep of facial recognition regulation uh, summer of 2020 and 2019 um, across the entire US. And there's a great uh, resource called Ban Facial Recognition. It's from the uh, um, Fight for the Future group where they track all of this progress. Um, and especially the ACLU was incredibly instrumental in pushing a lot of that work forward. Um, and you actually saw the company sort of saying, uh, we support facial recognition policy on the surface because they kind of understood that there was a public uh, cry for legislation on some level. However, the sort of challenge with regulation as a strategy is that uh, you know, a lot of these companies are very influential in Congress. Um, for every facial recognition bill, there's multiple Amazon lobbyists. Um, uh, there's also kind of interesting ties between different politicians and big tech. So for example, Kamala Harris, who's now uh, vice president, has a lot of connections to big tech um, uh, that made it pretty hard to lobby for further restrictions. And then the other as aspect of things as well is that, um, you know, even when uh, regulation forces a company to kind of take some level of accountability, in this case, um, the SEC forced Amazon to hold a shareholder vote uh, where uh, activist shareholders were trying to uh, uh, vote for the company to stop selling facial recognition to the police. Uh, unfortunately, Amazon itself as an organization has all these other tools of influence. So they ran a bunch of different campaigns to convince their shareholders uh, to vote to continue to potentially sell facial recognition to the police. So there's other levers of influence that these companies have and there's loopholes that they can kind of walk through even when they're regulated. Um, so I will very quickly go through this. Another thing that we can do is uh, this idea of a recall. So a recall is this idea of, you know, if I build a tool that causes harm um, and I throw it onto the market uh, and it's, dysfunctional and in a way that hurts people, uh, that product actually has no right to be on the market. Uh, it needs to be taken off of the market. So this concept of uh, you know taking a defective product or un unsafe product uh, from the market for the safety of the consumers uh, is, this, is, is, is called a recall. And we can see that with you know uh, NTSA and CPSC, so like different you know physical products and cars and you might think of like food, a defunct food. Um, and sometimes it's voluntary, um, but it can also be mandated. And we actually saw this happen with facial recognition where um, uh, Amazon, Microsoft and IBM, um, especially June 2020, when uh, the conversation around racial violence escalated and the police use of facial recognition was a, a sort of national topic, um, it became clear that uh, people did not trust the police to make use of this technology that was dysfunctional anyways. So there was this huge sort of public cry to stop the sale of facial recognition to police. And these companies actually recognize the, the, the sort of business necessity and reputational costs of keeping it on the market. So they, they did a voluntary recall and they pulled the facial recognition products that we had audited off of the market. You know, the challenge of this approach of a recall is that it really requires a lot of advocacy. Um, it took about two years of just nonstop yelling for Amazon to shift from complete denial of our results to uh, now this sort of uh, uh, moratorium that they're on with respect to their sale of facial recognition to police. And then the other sort of issue of a recall is that there's many loopholes. So Amazon says, we're not gonna sell our facial recognition product to police, but they're still selling these ring smart doorbell products. And those ring smart doorbells have a potential future facial recognition capability and um, will feed that footage back to police. So there's all of these loopholes that you can make when you have a voluntary recall, especially where you can make a claim as to what you're gonna do and then kind of do something that's not quite what the claim is, but something else. Uh, and that's a huge issue with recalls in general as a strategy for accountability. You know, but uh, you know, ultimately we've seen a lot of success with advocacy leading to particular recalls. In the case of the Stanford algorithm, because of a lot of the advocacy of the residents, 
um, they actually pulled the algorithm away and they said, we don't actually need this to be here. Um, they ended up going through a much more straightforward approach of just asking the department heads who is in the hospital. They will be the first ones to get it first come first served. Um, so, you know, recall is really good at getting a, a faulty algorithm out of the market and replacing it with something that's probably a lot more straightforward. Again, we saw a similar thing with um, the A-levels fiasco in the UK, um, where uh, because of the protest of a lot of the students, um, the UK government said, okay, you know what, we're gonna trust your teachers and we're just gonna go back to like a very simple, non-algorithmic approach of determining what your final grades are. Um, I'm very quickly gonna go through other challenges I think about, I am very cautious of time. Um, but another issue, uh, you know, outside of the, the, the three challenges of accountability and sort of specifically the different approaches we take to uh, engineering responsibility as a challenge, um, there's other things that are sort of related to that that I wanted to just briefly mention. So one is this issue of harms discovery. Um, I don't know, have, I don't have time to read through all these quotes, but we see a lot of situations where people have no clue that an algorithm is involved in a decision affecting their life. Um, you know, they they just they didn't know. Uh, here here's a quote of the renters not knowing that the tenant screening algorithm was involved. Um, uh, unemployment um, uh, 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 benefit recipients not understanding that an algorithm was involved, um, and uh, you know a false a false arrest due to a facial recognition match. Uh, where uh, we we don't know that an algorithm or facial recognition was involved at all. And that makes it very difficult uh, to pursue accountability just because we don't know if the AI is part of the equation. So we can't really identify the stakeholders to be looking at when trying to hold them to account. Uh, the other issue is this issue of auditor access and legal risk. Um, here's Julia Angwin from The Markup, which is an investigative journalism group that looks specifically at um, you know, tech accountability and, you know, they uh, do a lot of audit work, uh, third party audit work, and are constantly at risk of being um, sued under uh, the CFAA, sort of the fraud, uh, the anti hacking law, the, the fraud, uh, yeah, the sort of a main anti hacking law in the US. So, um, you know, they started this campaign called Scraping is Not a Crime. Um, and we kind of see a lot of this retaliation from these companies um, coming up again, where there's a lot of legal risk to doing accountability work for big tech. These are really powerful companies. So for example, you know, Facebook has been attacking NYU and an algorithm research group called uh, Algorithm Watch that has been trying to hold them accountable for their um, newsfeed. And then also we see, um, you know, Clearview AI, which is sort of the infamous facial recognition firm really attacking a lot of um, uh, the watchdogs there. Uh, and, but we've made a little bit of progress. So Christian Sandvig, who sort of uh, academic researcher recently won a, a, a small a small case where uh, he was able to um, push back against the CFAA to protect one of his projects um, and and sort of protect him legally from uh, being charged by, by this under this sort of anti hacking law. Um, and then the other challenges are just a very material so uh, machine learning research and engineering. Uh, it's kind of really messy. We don't think about how to handle data very well. We have these huge data sets that we're not really reflective on how they're made, how they're sort of translated in deployment. Um, and that's already uh, that's always been a sort of ongoing challenge. Um, and then he here's also like kind of another issue where um, in machine learning research and engineering, we don't think very thoroughly about evaluation and all the different steps involved. Um, uh, so this is from a recent paper I was working on looking at uh, how evaluation is really this complex process in um, machine learning, but we don't actually break it down and reflect on each step. So, you know, if there's anything to take away from this talk, it's that machine learning doesn't work if it doesn't work for everyone. And we need to reflect on what it means for the system to be out there in the world to the degree it is hurting people to the degree it is. Um, we can't justify the release and development of these tools if um, we're not thinking conscientiously about how we create these tools and how we evaluate them and how we hold them accountable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, you covered so many different topics in such a short amount of time. I am blown away and I'm taking so many notes. So thank you. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, um, but I hope that folks can reach out to you if they have questions that can engage you in other ways. So thank you. I, you know, one thing that I was really struck by that I'm still thinking a lot about is one of the first quotes that you put up that said, when AI fails, people get hurt. And so mm -hmm. I'm really interested in um, how you're conceptualizing hurt, 
what is that like what does that really mean within an AI context and is auditing the right solution to hurt or harm yeah that's that's a very social worker uh <laughs> response I love that um yeah I think I think hurt can mean a lot of things and actually there's a, a lot of discussion right now about breaking out like what is what do we actually mean by harm because even the way that uh, discrimination and bias shows up through algorithms you know it might be because a model is correct for a, a, you know a, the majority of the population and consistently incorrect for a, a subset of the population. It could be because uh, a model could be functioning very well, but it's sort of disproportionately deployed to like harass a particular subset of the population. Um, there's so many ways, or it could be mischaracterizing a particular population because it's baked in certain biases. So there's so many ways in which harm can manifest. And I think when I say hurt, I mean any kind of harm or negative consequence that comes as a result of that algorithm. Um, and that's also why it was really compelling for me to start with those stories because, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly struck by just how serious the consequences are. You know, people losing their jobs, people, um, you know, having to sleep in a motel for a year, uh, just very serious life consequences as a result of these algorithms not being properly built or being deployed in contexts where they really should not be deployed um, um, or used in ways um, to, to sort of target or harass particular minority groups you know all of this uh has these very serious lived uh like th these very serious uh, uh, consequences for people and they're really going through these lived experiences that i think often go unacknowledged where we we think we see the high level stat and we're like wow that's a you know that's a really low you know acceptance rate or that's a really low accuracy but then we don't actually acknowledge that like because that system failed or because that system um Kind of either malfunctioned or was weaponized against a particular group, uh, it caused you know an individual life to be really disrupted in a serious way. Thank you so much. There are lots <laughs> of uh, uh, thanks in the chat. If okay. you want to look at the Q and A, there are some questions there for you if you want to respond at another time. But I just want to thank you so much for your time. This was wonderful. Happy to have you back at the DSI anytime. But thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This is great. Take good care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.